And our next speaker is Professor uh, Tony Komarov, who is Professor of Internal Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And uh, Tony is a clinical researcher. This means that he sees patients on a regular basis, not only patients with CFS, but as well also others. He does research, high quality research, uh, but Tony is also editor-in-chief of Harvard Medical Publications. And uh, uh, you started to reach out to society to explain difficult medical issues so people could actually understand it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we just heard uh, something. Can I break the news about Dr. K? Am I allowed? <laughs> so in September, uh, Tony will start a weekly um, column uh, that's going to be called Ask Dr. K. And uh, you know, this is of immense importance that professionals with a, a with a such a knowledge in the medical uh, field and medical issues can actually explain to to the public, to patients and to others what's happening in the medical field. It's something that interests everyone. So uh, it's so good that high quality information is coming out on the net. You're going to talk, uh, I will take one minute more, Tony, and say that you know, uh, it's so wonderful to have you here because when we started our first polyclinic uh, for patients with chronic fatigue syndrome at Huddinge Hospital, Huddinge University Hospital was the name in those days, in 95, you came and we had a kickoff with other colleagues to try to establish good clinical practice and also uh, set agenda for a research. Uh, this polyclinic was paid for by the uh, Clinic of Infectious Diseases at Huddinge. That is, we had no funding, there was no respect, no understanding, I would say, from uh, the politicians or decision makers. But through this work uh, and these contacts with international expertise and also the work we did at Huddinge, and not the least the sign of patient democracy, with patients telling the politicians and decision makers, here we are, we don't get what we need for our taxpayers' money. This new uh, polyclinic that Paris just described has started, and this is established inside the healthcare system, and this is unique. It's unique for Sweden, and maybe for many parts of the world, actually. So uh, it's really a fantastic uh, day, I think, and uh, it's fantastic to have you here for a second kickoff. Thank you, uh, uh, the several Brigittas, uh, for for this invitation to be here back in Stockholm, one of the world's most beautiful cities. I I love having a second opportunity to be here. Um, today, what I want to talk about is the biology of chronic fatigue syndrome, and particularly to address two questions. Uh, and they are questions that are raised in the minds of many doctors, many scientists, and many people. Uh, because, I believe, the illness we are talking about, at least uh, the American CDC, definition of the illness defines the illness only by a group of symptoms. And so the obvious question that would come to the mind of any clinician, any scientist, is are there objective biological markers uh, that are abnormal in this illness that is defined only by symptoms? And I believe the answer to that is yes. Uh, and the second question is, do we understand the pathogenesis or the cause of this illness? And I'm afraid the answer to that right now is no. This is, uh, a, for the last 25 years, has been a topic that has merited increasing research in the United States and in many countries around the world. There have been and remain uh, large programs at the NIH and the CDC uh, 
many international research conferences. The last time I counted, about 4,500 peer-reviewed publications on the illness, a few of which we'll discuss today. Uh, and according to a survey that the uh, US CDC uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, nearly 40% of American physicians say they have seen patients with this illness in their practice. And all of them essentially have heard of the illness. Um, and that was very different than 25 years ago. I will show you a Venn diagram uh, that is very much like what Dr. Yulin just showed. Um, there is a, the problem of fatigue is a very large problem, a very common cause of seeking medical care in the United States. Whoops. The, um, many of the patients who come to a doctor with a complaint of fatigue are experiencing a primary depressive disorder. That, I think, is um, unarguable and very important. Uh, what I think is less well documented, but probably also true, is that overwork, uh, not depression, accounts for many cases of fatigue that come to medical practice. Studies in most of the developed nations of the world over the last 30 years show a dramatic increase in the work week, particularly in the United States, and particularly for women. Um, so I think this too is a contributor to the complaint of fatigue. As we all know, all of us here who are health professionals, uh, there are quite a number of organic diseases that can cause fatigue as the presenting symptom. Uh, and then uh, there is this entity we're talking about today, which I think also causes a, a small fraction of patients who seek care for fatigue. There are several case definitions, as Dr. Yulene just showed you. The one that has been most widely used, the CDC definition, defines this illness as a severe fatigue that has persisted or elapsed for at least six months uh, and is of new and definite onset and not relieved by rest and results in a very substantial reduction in an individual's capacity to function both in the workplace and at home. And in addition to that, very severe and prolonged fatigue, there must be a group of other symptoms that also are present for at least six months. And then finally, there must not be any of several other medical and psychiatric conditions that can produce fatigue. Who are the patients who are seen in practices that see referrals for this illness. They are typically adults in their mid-19, in their mid-30s, but children and people who become ill at later stages in life are not uncommon. The majority are women. In office-based practices, the majority are middle class, uh, in population-based studies, such as those done by the CDC, our group, and Leonard Jason's group in Chicago, actually this illness is more common among certain minority populations in the United States, African Americans, Latinos. Interestingly, much less common in Asian uh, populations. In office-based surveys, uh, the patients are somewhat more educated than the average United States citizen, uh, and they are severely impaired, with 50% intermittently being shut in uh, or bedridden. In our practice, the duration of illness among the 400 patients we've seen over the last 25 years uh, has averaged 14 years. Uh, and has been as long as 36 years in one of the patients. One of the things that be 
got me interested in this illness is that the patients not only had fatigue, which is not at all an uncommon problem in practice, but they said that their state of chronic fatigue had begun suddenly with what they called a flu or a virus or a cold, an infectious-like syndrome characterized by sore throat, cough, runny nose, swollen lymph glands, aching muscles, fever, headache, diarrhea, symptoms that suggested a chronic infection, symptoms like they had had many times in the past, but this time they did not get better. And that was something that I and other people who began studying this illness about 25 years ago had not heard before among patients with fatigue. So the first question that we and other people ask is, why are these patients not suffering from uh, just depression? And there's now a rich literature on this. I'm only going to show one or two studies. Uh, but I believe the answer is because there are a number of objective neuroendocrine findings that are quite different in patients with this illness than in those with major depression. Uh, treatment studies of antidepressants do not result in cures of this illness and the results of formal psychiatric assessment in hundreds of patients uh, around the world show that while there may be a greater uh, frequency of depression developing after, in the time after people become ill, uh, still 30 to 50 percent have never had and continue not to have any diagnosable depression or other uh, non-psychotic uh, psychiatric disorders. These are two commonly obtained neuroendocrine studies in major depression, the studies of cortisol and ACTH release after stimulation with corticotrophin releasing hormone, and prolactin release after stimulant, I forget what the ligand was uh, in, this, in this study. The point is there are characteristic rises in ACTH, falls in prolactin in patients with major depression, but in chronic fatigue syndrome, the exact opposite is seen. It is as if the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is down-regulated in chronic fatigue syndrome rather than upregulated as it is in major depression. So I will argue today, going rapidly through a literature of several thousand papers, that there uh, is abundant evidence that the brain and autonomic nervous system are involved in this illness, that there is chronic activation of several arms of the immune system, that there are ongoing oxidative and nitrosative stress and abnormalities in energy metabolism, and that there is a possible role in many, if not all, patients that infectious agents may play in triggering and perpetuating the illness. So what about the brain and autonomic nervous system? Uh, to summarize the large literature, the bulk of the published literature reports finding areas of high signal, punctate areas of high signal on MRI of T2-weighted MRI typically in the white matter of the brain, most often in the subcortical white matter, but sometimes at deeper levels. SPECT scanning also uh, has consistently shown abnormalities. Formal studies of thinking, of cognition, have found impairments in information processing speed, memory, and attention that are not explained by concomitant psychiatric disorders. Autonomic dysfunction, sleep disorders, uh, and multiple neuroendocrine um, manifestations that only a, two of which I just showed you. Here is an MR picture, uh, uncharacteristic in that this 
area, punctate area of high signal is in the cerebellum, typically you see multiple such spots in, uh, in the subcortical white matter in chronic fatigue syndrome. And you see them much more commonly than in controls. Here is a study we published nearly 20 years ago of two groups of patients with this illness. One, a group who appeared to be part of an epidemic of the illness in Northern California and Nevada, and others, patients from endemic areas, not clearly part of any epidemic. These white matter abnormalities on MRI were seen in nearly 80% of the two patient groups compared with 20% of the healthy controls matched same age, same sex, same MRI machines, same group of neuroradiologists reading all of the images with nearly perfect agreement among them in calling the presence or absence of these images. On SPECT scanning, now not, not a qualitative assessment of the image, but a count of the radiation coming from the, a mid-cerebral plane in the brain. There were, we, we uh, had four groups that were compared, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, patients with AIDS encephalopathy, patients with major depression, and healthy controls. And the signal in these two groups was nearly identical and significantly different from the signal in these two groups, both objectively and by image interpretation. Here is a SPECT scan, patient with chronic fatigue syndrome who had a transient period lasting several days of uh, hemianesthesia and other sensory deficits, paresthesias, hypesthesias, of the uh, right side of his body, along with cognitive impairment. SPECT scanning is a radionuclide study of signal, radionuclide signal, and you, as you can see, the left side of this individual's brain has much less of the yellow signal than the right side of the brain. Several days later, when this, these symptoms had passed, this SPECT scan had resolved at most of its abnormalities and clearly was improving along with the symptom improvement. This is just one anecdote, but studies of hundreds of patients uh, reveal the same thing. This is a summary that, like most subjects in all of medicine, not all of the medical literature is absolutely consistent, but the preponderance of studies and the preponderance of patients in those studies that find MRI and SPECT abnormalities on patients far, it, 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 it is far greater than the studies that have not found these abnormalities. With autonomic uh, nervous system, the same thing is true. There are many studies now in both adults and adolescents with this illness that find both sympathetic and parasympathetic dysfunction in patients with this illness. The majority of published studies showing that uh, outweighing the minority that have not found it. Studies of cognition, as I said earlier, uh, find a quotes normal IQ, but none of those studies have had available to them the IQs in those patients in the years before they became ill to compare the normal IQ to. For example, uh, I have a patient in my practice whose IQ is normal, 102, uh, but who graduated at the top of her class at Harvard. Uh, I think it's clear that her IQ at baseline, before she became ill, had not been 102. Uh, formal studies of information processing speed uh, and 
complex qualitative ability to, to uh, deal with multiple simultaneously presented tasks reveal in virtually all of the literature clear abnormalities. The capacity to acquire new information and uh, learning or recalling complex verbal material all impaired in multiple studies by different investigators of different groups of patients with preservation by and large of higher order skills like planning and verbal fluency. The deficiencies are not explained by studies of covariant any coexistent psychiatric disorders with the cognitive test results. This is a study we published just uh, six weeks ago using electroencephalography, or specifically the technique of spectral coherence in brain wave studies of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome compared with healthy controls and major depression controls. These spectral coherence patterns clearly distinguished the patients with chronic fatigue syndrome from those who were the healthy controls, same age, same gender, same socioeconomic background, uh, and from the depressed controls. Basically, in the patients who were off all psychoactive medications, which medications can affect the patterns of uh, EEG, uh, nearly 90% were accurately classified, and this was true when a new set of patients was tested based on the patterns established from the first group. Uh, the healthy controls, nearly 90% were accurately distinguished from CFS, and of the depressed patients, all of them were clearly distinguished from both CFS and healthy controls. Smaller number of those studied, but still uh, a very clear distinction. So by many techniques, of uh, standard techniques of looking at the brain, suggestions of clear underlying abnormalities. Dr. Yulene talked about proteomic uh, markers. Uh, this is a study of proteomic markers in spinal fluid in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome versus healthy controls. Uh, there were many proteins found by mass spectroscopy that were present in the CFS patients, but not in the healthy patients. These are five of the more striking differences. There were many. Uh, and what they tended to say as a pattern is that there is ongoing central nervous system inflammation and injury requiring the recruitment of structural repair proteins, that there was a state of uh, oxidative stress to which antioxidants were responding, uh, and then several proteases involved in the inflammatory response were also present much more often. This is a study of lactic acid in spinal fluid in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome using in vivo proton MR spectroscopy. Uh, and as you see, the Oops, sorry. The um, levels of lactic acid in the patients with chronic fatigue syndrome were much higher than in a group of uh, anxiety controls and healthy controls where there was no difference. This is a study published last year from the University of Utah in which a whole group of molecules in peripheral lymphocytes, some of them involved in sensory uh, signaling, central nervous system sensory signaling, uh, several reflecting adrenal function and several immune response markers, most of them pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, were studied in relationship to fatigue, uh, and in, I'm sorry, in relationship to exercise. Why? Because part of the definition of chronic fatigue syndrome is a post-exertional fatigue state uh, and a flare-up of many different symptoms 
about 12 to 24 hours after physical exertion. So the question was, would you be able to measure metabolic differences following a standard stress, physical stress challenge in these patients compared with healthy control subjects?